I'll start. So good morning. Um, so um, this is uh, work uh, done uh, by my postdoc, Jin Han Xie, who is unfortunately not able to be here. And so he asked me um, to give this talk. Um, in fact, the slides are his, so any errors uh, uh, are not going to be directly mine, at least. And this is a collaboration with Keith Julian in, um, in, uh, in Boulder and uh, his postdoc, uh, Benjamin Michael. Uh, so I'm going to talk about um, a phenomenon called uh, salt fingering um, or salt finger convection, which is a very important process in the oceans. So let me explain the basic physics behind this. Um, so uh, I am imagining that I have um, uh, a situation where I have a linear salinity profile. So the salinity increases from bottom to top, for example, due to evaporation in the equatorial regions. And I also have a temperature that increases linearly from bottom to top. So it's cold here, warm at the top, okay? Uh, but in such a way that the overall density, which of course uh, has contributions from both the temperature and the salinity, is still decreasing upwards. So this is a so-called statically stable situation. It doesn't overturn, right? But nonetheless, you have some potential energy in the salinity field that can drive an instability in the presence of diffusion. And so I want to talk about this diffusive instability, which is the salt finger instability that arises in this case. Um, so the important parameter here is going to be uh, something called the density ratio. Uh, if you uh, imagine that you write down um, an equation for how the density varies with temperature and salinity, and linearize that relation, uh, these are the two contributions to the uh, density changes and the ratio uh, tells me whether I have enough energy in the salinity field to actually drive the instability. And then the other important parameter is this parameter tau, which is the ratio of the diffusion coefficient of salt uh, relative to the diffusion coefficient of temperature. And in the ocean, that's a small quantity, it's something like one over 100. And in the talk, I will uh, make use of the fact that this is a small parameter to simplify the primitive equations. So the basic physics is if I take a fluid parcel here and I move it downwards, right? So I'm taking something that is hot and salty, I move it to a region which is cold and less salty. Uh, then I want to find out what happens in its new location. Well, in its new location, temperature equilibrates very rapidly because it diffuses much more rapidly than salt. And that means the parcel here is going to maintain its salt content from here, but now it's in a region where the salt concentration is less, and so it maintains its negative buoyancy and keeps sinking, right? That's the, that's the notion of a salt finger. So, uh, so, sorry. So this is an important process. Uh, so these are some oceanic measurements that we are interested in. So what you see here is the depth as, and temperature on the horizontal axis. And what you see is that the instability generates these, uh, this kind of staircase structure in the salinity profile. Uh, and this, of course, is important for mixing of the upper regions of the, of the ocean. And these are very stable. These can persist for, for months or even years, this, this staircase structure. So I'm not going to talk about the staircases, but I'll just talk about uh, what leads to the initial mixing via the, uh, um, the salt finger instability. And this is what, sorry, the, the vertical unit um, was the depth. So I'm just going down from 200 um, meters down to 500 meters, okay? Yeah. Uh, so this is what the instability looks like. This is a, a 2D calculation, but 3D calculations are also available. Um, so uh, you set up these uh, density and salinity profiles in the way I indicated on the first slide, and then you run an initial value problem, and you see the formation of these structures depending, of course, on the parameter RO, that was that density ratio I mentioned, and you see different structures. So here, for larger values of RO, you see nice fingers. They are the types of things that I'm talking about, and then you have the cold, fresh fingers rising in between, all right? So that's the process. It's driven by diffusion. It's not a it's dynamical instability. <coughs> so there's been a lot of work on this, and I don't have time in this brief talk to describe all the various approaches that have been uh, uh, um, adopted to study uh, the consequences of this kind of inst instability. But I'm going to be interested here in, in trying to get a simplified description of this instability that will enable me to determine what is the saturated state or statistically stationary state of this instability. So let's go to the next slide. So what are the basic equations? So I'm going to just do this in 2D, but we can do everything I've been describing in 3D. 
Uh, so here are the equations for the fluctuation in temperature and fluctuation in salinity uh, relative to these linear profiles that I introduced at the beginning. Uh, here are the dimensional equations in 2D. In 2D is somewhat simpler. What I've done here in the first equation is I've t eliminated the pressure by taking the curl of the Navier-Stokes equation that allows me to introduce a stream function which is convenient for this purpose. Here are the buoyancy terms uh, that drive the flow. Here is viscous dissipation. And then I have equations for the advection and diffusion of that temperature and salinity fluctuations. Here are the background uh, gradients, and these, of course, diffuse at different rates, as I indicated, right? Heat diffuses more rapidly than salt, and that's going to be important. So uh, we always want to non-dimensionalize these uh, kinds of equations, um, and we need to have a characteristic length scale for the fingers. And it turns out the characteristic length scale for the fingers is given by this combination of parameters. So uh, mu is the viscosity, thermal diffusivity, acceleration to gravity, thermal expansion coefficient, and here is this linear temperature gradient. That's this, this is going to give you the right order of magnitude for the finger size, which you can get out of linear theory. And uh, so we're going to use this scale d to non-dimensionalize the equations. And then we have other scales for the, for the temperature, salinity, the, the magnitude of the stream function, and time. Um, and that, uh, when I'm done, I'm going to introduce the following dimensionless quantities that will determine what happens. There is a, this parameter tau, which is the ratio of the diffusivities. That's the small parameter. Uh, then I have another quantity called the Schmidt number. That's the ratio of viscosity to thermal uh, diffusivity. This is large in the ocean, but in astrophysical applications, this could be of order one. Uh, and then we have this buoyancy ratio that I've already introduced. Okay. In the ocean, the Schmidt number is, is high. It's hundreds, oh, yeah. probably oh, okay. 500, 600. Sorry. But in, in uh, astrophysical applications, where viscosity is much lower because it's photon viscosity, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you, know, you will have, um, have, have lower values of, of this uh, quantity. Okay, and then uh, you know, it's also useful to think in terms of, um, of Rayleigh numbers. So this is the thermal Rayleigh number and the salinity Rayleigh number. And, in, and the, the, uh, the way I've defined this quantity D uh, the uh, thermal value number is just H over D. So that gives you the kind of aspect ratio of the system. So, so if I non-dimensionalize the equations, as I indicated, uh, here are the equations, here are these dimensionless parameters, tau here, and then the Schmidt number appears over here, and then the driving is through this uh, density ratio RO. So here are the equations. You know, these are effectively the primitive equations for the problem, um, and of course we can simulate them, but uh, uh, the simulation is a little bit difficult when tau is very small, like, you know, 1 over 100. And so it's good to get rid of this tau dependence. And so I'm going to do that uh, uh, in the next few slides. So first we're going to do linear theory. So linear theory, I just perturb about the, uh, the, these linear profiles that we saw. And then I get a, a cubic dispersion relation. This is all very standard. I get a growing salt finger instability. If this last term in the dispersion relation is negative, and that occur, uh, that's the case when this parameter RO is greater than one. Um, so that's you're statically stable, uh, but uh, it's uh, less than one over tau. That's the diffusive uh, instability uh, threshold. Okay, so that's um, so we're going to be interested in the situation where uh, tau is very small. So if this is my parameter plane, so this is tau, this is one over RO. I'm going to be interested in small tau and large driving, so large RO means 1 over RO is small, so I'm interested in this regime. And that is uh, of interest, actually, in a number of applications, in particular to the ocean. Right? So the basic idea is to take the limit, tau goes to 0, um, RO is 1 over tau, so it goes to infinity, in such a way that the product uh, here, uh, RO times tau, remains of order 1. Right? That's the idea. So uh, we do that here. Uh, so we rescale the temperature. The temperature fluctuation is going to be small because thermal diffusivity is very strong in this limit. Okay. Uh, we rescale S with this parameter. Then we take the limit R goes to zero, tau goes to zero, excuse me. And then we get a very simple equation that relates the stream function to the temperature. So we can eliminate the temperature and we get uh, this set of equations. Right? So we go from three PDEs down to two PDEs. The errors are small, they order one, uh, they order tau, 
And so this is uh, like the equation of, of, uh, for, for Bernard convection. Um, it's driven by here by salt gradients, not temperature gradients. The inter interesting thing here is a new term that gives you damping at large scales due to the thermal effect in addition to viscous damping at small scales, right? And so the, the balance between those two effects is what gives you the salt finger scale, in fact. And then you have an equation for the advection diffusion of salt. So this is for, for uh, Schmidt number of order one. If I take this oceanic limit I've mentioned, uh, and that is uh, the Schmidt number much bigger than one, right? Typically it's 500 or something like that. Then I can get, I get rid of um, um, this, uh, excuse me. Uh, I get rid of uh, uh, this term, the inertial term, and I end up with uh, an even simpler problem, which is the one we actually study in detail. I just have a simple equation for advection diffusion of salt, and it's coupled to the uh, stream function, right? So I have a dynamical equation for the salt. I have a, a so-called uh, diagnostic equation uh, for the uh, velocity field, okay? Sorry? Well, the energy is conserved in the absence of diffusion, but everything is, is driven by diffusion. So energy conservation is not... It, it's, it, it, the potential energy is released by the instability. That's what drives the instability. So, uh, um, so if you maintain the gradients that I've introduced at the beginning, if you maintain the gradients, uh, then there will be a statistically stationary state because... Um, you're not using up the gradients, if you, uh, as, you know, as the instability proceeds. Uh, am I answering your question? Um, so, th so, so this is the problem I want to talk about. The other ones I don't have time to discuss. Um, so let's just uh, um, show that there are some exact nonlinear solutions of this. They take the form of, uh, we call them elevator modes. So these are these um, descending salt fingers like this and the rising fresh fingers. So there's a uh, wave. Yes. X is the horizontal direction, uh, horizontal, and Z is vertical. Z is vertical. So when M is zero, it means there is no vertical dependence. So these are just structures that are going up and down like this. And you can calculate the growth rate very easily, and it shows that the, the optimal growth rate is at M equals zero. So these elevator modes that have no structure in, in Z uh, grow the fastest, and they have this particular wave number, this the horizontal wave number, um, as you can see here, for different values of RA. And you can calculate the, you know, the uh, optimum mode, um, uh, the, the, the wave number, and also the growth rate, right? And uh, so this just shows you what the optimal growth rate looks like as a function of the supercriticality, super which is this Rayleigh, Rayleigh ratio minus one. The critical value of that is one. We can also look at stability of these states. We're using Floquet theory, and this just compares what happens uh, in this um, reduced model, that last set of equations that I talked about, this is that modified Rayleigh-Bernard uh, problem with this large-scale dissipation term, and then the original uh, primitive systems. And you can see that uh, we have retained in our highly reduced system, um, you know, uh, essentially the, the, the full properties of the original primitive equations. So, um, so let's talk about the properties of the reduced system now and the statistically steady states. So this is what you get if you take the, this reduced system, that, you know, has this uh, prognostic and diagnostic uh, structure, and you integrate the equation starting from random initial conditions, small amplitude initial conditions. Well, first you get this kind of very abrupt growth of this instability. You generate lots of fingers, and then the interactions between the fingers lead to this uh, statistically stationary state. So this is a picture of what the solution looks like uh, here at the peak energy. So this is depth or height. This is the horizontal scale. And then over here you see the statistically stationary state where you have little fingers that are descending, uh, of salt fingers and rising uh, structures in, in between. Okay. So that's the, the state. So here is, is the energy in the salinity field as a function of the supercriticality. So this curly R is Ra minus 1. It just tells you how far above threshold for the instability you are. And you see different regimes here indicated by these uh, uh, lines, which are power law fits to the data that you get from the simulations. Okay? So I want to just say a few words uh, about how we uh, um, determine these power law scalings in this, in this regime. <coughs> 
And of course, the reason for doing this is because we want to understand you know, how effective um, is, uh, is this process. For example, for subgrid uh, scale modeling, or, you know, for example, it ultimately in GCMs, uh, where these kinds of small scale processes are ignored uh, at the present time. So this is again a picture of what, uh, what uh, the structures look like um, in this statistically stationary state. You see actually they are patchy, you know, you can get these regions where you have a lot of activity, this lots of descending fingers are generated here, in pla other places you don't, and this is for as large a value of, uh, of the driving or the salinity gradient um, that drives the uh, instability. So that's the, and so what do we find? Well, um, we uh, do um, a spectral analysis of these uh, uh, pictures that I've just shown you, and we try to look at the spectral peaks, and that defines, of course, a, 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 an op, you know, a, a wave number that characterizes the scale of the structure, and that wave number called K finger here uh, are these uh, data points from the simulations, and you see they track very closely the wave number that you get from this optimal theory, just looking at these elevator modes that have no vertical structures. So we use that as an ingredient in the analysis. And the analysis is based on looking at our reduced equations and trying to see which terms dominate in which regime. And that, of course, depends on the strength of the forcing as determined by that curly R uh, parameter. So here, um, at, at low forcing, what you see in the diagnostic equation, uh, you see that the terms that balance very closely are the terms that involve the salinity and, um, um, and, the, uh, and, and uh, the stream function here. This term is, is damped very strongly because uh, at these uh, slow forcings, um, uh, viscosity uh, is unimportant. And you see the here the prognostic, sorry, this is the diagnostic equation at the larger value of RA, and you see the balance is a little bit different. You have a balance between this term, and now this term becomes also significant, and in fact, this this term that becomes small. Okay, so we, we use these balances uh, between the terms um, um, to, um, to, to look at which terms dominate uh, in which regime. And we do the same thing for the prognostic equation. Here is the prognostic equation. That's the time evolution equation. There's a nonlinear term and some linear terms. And again, you can see here, for example, that the dominant term for this value of RA is the nonlinear term, and then uh, this time dependence, that's because you have a, you know, an instability that grows, um, is, is, is growing, so, so, so you have a, um, sorry, how should I say this? In the statistically stationary regime, the, this, the, uh, the time scale is, is, small, is slow, so you have a balance between these two terms. And then at larger values of forcing, you have a balance between these terms and this term, the linear term in this equation becomes unimportant. So those, that's, those are the ingredients that we use. So for example, in regime one, um, well, we know what is the characteristic length scale in the horizontal and also in the vertical direction. It goes like the w uh, one over the four uh, power of this superperiodicality. Um, and so we're going to use this fact to try to get the scaling laws for the uh, salinity perturbation and for the stream function psi with this parameter r, okay? And so the first regime is when r is small, so relatively close to the threshold, um, and then the balances give you these relations. This one is from the uh, diagnostic equation, uh, this one is from the, um, from the uh, prognostic equation, and we use uh, these scaling laws in these uh, equations, and they gave us relations between these powers, and those relations can be solved and they gave us predictions A3 over 4 and B equals 1, and that is exactly what was observed in the simulation. So that approach works. Uh, now we go to larger forcing, uh, and in the, when you look at larger forcing, um, we, um, we look at uh, spectra, this is wave number horizontally, energy in the salinity field. Uh, I show two things here in solid line, which is the interesting thing, I integrate the spectrum with respect to M, that's the vertical wave number, so I get a 1D projection, if you like, of the spectrum, and I pick out a, a peak at small scales, that's the Solfinger scale, and then I also have uh, a lot of power at large scales, so I have to look at the interaction between small scales and large scales, and look at the dominant balances um, that arise uh, from, from that, and uh, that is summarized over here. 
I decompose the salinity and the, and the velocity field or the stream function into large scale components and also small scale components. And I look at dominant balances in the, using the same procedure I just outlined. And uh, you, you know, this figure just shows uh, you know, where most of the activity is. That's the peak of, the, uh, of this one dimensional spectrum. And then at the end, I'm skipping a few details here. Uh, you end up with scaling laws uh, like this. And uh, if you look at uh, what these things look like, in, you know, when R is, of, is of order one, you get scaling that looks like this. And when R goes to infinity, you get a scaling that looks like this. And if I just go back, uh, these scaling laws uh, agree very well with uh, these. Um, these are the straight lines, in fact, that I've put on this figure. And you see that they match the uh, characteristics of this, uh, of this flow rather well. So I just have one more thing to, s to show you. Um, uh, we've also looked at uh, PDFs and the um, of, of, of various quantities in the flow. Uh, of particular interest is, uh, is the salt gradient, the distribution of salt gradients. And you see that in contrast to, uh, to these uh, other quantities, uh, um, um, uh, this is the salt distribution, this is the vertical velocity distribution, which are nice in Gaussian. Uh, these uh, uh, salt gradients are highly anisotropic. You have uh, this stretch Gaussian uh, uh, form. And we, uh, we believe that, th that, these, that this shape is a signature of the, of the basic process that leads to saturation of the salt finger principle. And it has to do with the fact that I have descending a cold plume, uh, excuse me, uh, salt fingers from above, and I have rising freshwater fingers. They, lead, they collide. And that is the process that limits the length scale of the fingers in this fully developed regime. And that uh, translates in, into this uh, asymmetry between, um, between um, positive gradients and negative gradients, right? Because when the fingers collide, you, you create locally very strong uh, uh, cylindrical gradients. So my conclusions are here. So I derived a, a hierarchy of models, reduced models, simplified that are valid in this limit of small diffusivity ratio. I talked about one of these models, the simplest one of those, um, which applies in the oceans where the Schmidt number is large. So I formally took the limit of infinite Schmidt number. And we saw structures that um, uh, you know, n resemble uh, uh, simulations of, of the primitive equations. And we believe they also represent uh, what happens uh, under realistic conditions uh, in the oceans. So, um, so we, we, we saw that the uh, reduced system uh, retains many of the properties of the primitive system, but of course it depends on fewer parameters, so it's easier to characterize the saturated state. And then um, um, you know, I computed uh, the, uh, how the saturated state depends on the driving through this uh, Rayleigh ratio and I also uh, showed you some uh, uh, PDFs of the various quantities that characterize this flow. And there is a paper on this that appeared earlier this year. So thank you very much. Yeah, please. At the beginning, you show us uh, three or four uh, pictures mm -hmm. with this uh, solidity. Uh, they were uh, DMS or whatever, yeah. and simulation. Yeah, yeah simulation. Then, uh, but the structure over there are much bigger than uh, the structure in your obtain uh, with the, your, uh, uh, let's say, the user's model. No, because, because the, the DNS necessarily is in a smaller domain, so the fingers you know, are, are relatively large compared to the, to the domain size. One of the things that we can do here very easily is we can look at very large domains and therefore get you know, um, uh, a much better understanding of the, of, the of the statistically stationary state. In fact, if the domain is too small, uh, you get other types of saturation. And, and, and in, in particular, you get this kind of bursting, irregular bursting, uh, which doesn't occur if the domain is larger. So you can be misled you know, as to what is the saturation so mechanism. The DNS was a zoom of your it's a zoom, yes. Okay. Yes, it's a zoom. Yeah. Okay.
large but finite sweet number. So then instead of the algebraic equation there, you get a slow equation. Uh, so do, don't you have a slow fast dynamic some kind of realization solution? Well, yeah, okay, that's an interesting question. So one way, of course, is to, uh, is to rather than you know, take this limit, uh, which uh, what I've taken formally is the, um, you know, is the, is the fast limit. Um, so I'm just looking at processes on a certain scale, but you're, you're right that there are longer time scales in the process mm -hmm. because of, of the large value of the Schmidt number. So we haven't looked at that. Not in, in n not in experiments, but in simulations, if you make the domain too small, you do get relaxation oscillation. So when, you're, when you were talking about bursting, and this is probably also... Well, so I, in, in our experiments, if we use the same parameter values, but the small domain, we have bursts, which I didn't show you, I'm sorry. If you make this, for the same parameter values, if we increase the domain, the bursts disappear. Uh -huh. So the bursts are clearly due to... A, you know, due to the domain size. And so in that sense, I don't think they would be relevant to the oceanographic application. Okay. 